So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the fourth Physiology of Obesity Mechanisms to Medicine webinar. This series started off a few years ago now and following three symposia at the European Congress on Obesity and Experimental Biology and a day at Physiology 19, we're now delighted to bring this into a summer webinar series for ECRs to present their work during the pandemic. So just some housekeeping notes before uh, my colleague Joe introduces our speakers. Um, each speaker will deliver a 20 minute talk and then we'll have 15 minutes or so for open discussion and Q&A. You can submit questions at any time through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And these will be directed to speakers by us during the Q&A portion of the webinar, but please feel free to submit them any time. You can submit these anonymously if you'd like to. If not, please include your institution as well so we can announce this with your name. We might not have time for all of the questions, but we'll try and get through as many as possible. So you can upvote questions and also type your own answers or comments under another attendee's questions. And please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available to re-watch. And please feel free to follow on Twitter with the Physiology M2M hashtag. And thank you, over to Joe. Hello everyone. Our first talk today is by Emily Mia Dobrodska, uh, who's based at the Institute of Metabolic Science at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Emily is a PhD student focusing on the development of organoid models of, hum of the human enter endocrine system. Over to you, Emily. Thank you. Sorry, just unmuted myself. Thanks, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm a second year PhD student, as Joe mentioned, in the Gribble Ryman group at Cambridge's Institute of Metabolic Science. And I'm going to be discussing our work developing human organoid models of small intestinal GLP-1 secretion, focusing on our recent paper, which was published a few months ago in Cell Reports. So before I start, I've been asked to give a quick overview of my career hist history to date. So I'm originally from Edinburgh and I studied natural sciences at Cambridge, specialising in pharmacology. After graduating, I had a brief foray into the world of work before realising that I actually missed doing science and returned to Cambridge to start a 1 plus 3 PhD. During my MRes, I carried out rotations with David Savage, Anthony Davenport and Fiona Gribble and Frank Ryman before joining their lab for my PhD, where I work on gut hormone physiology. So enteroendocrine cells are a specialised cell type scattered throughout the gastrointestinal epithelium. And they secrete gut hormones in response to ingested nutrients, neurohormonal signals, and other, other contents in the intestinal lumen, such as bile acids and microbial products. There are around 20 different metabolically active gut hormones, and these all play concerted roles in the regulation of digestion, nutrient absorption and availability, satiety, and glucose homeostasis. In this talk, I'm going to focus on glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, which is secreted from a subset of enteroendocrine cells known as L cells, which are mainly located in the distal small intestine and the colon. So GLP-1 and its sister hormone, GIP, underlie the incretin effect. This is a phenomenon by which oral glucose induces significantly more insulin secretion than an equivalent load of glucose given intravenously. GLP-1 directly potentiates glucose-stimulated insulin secretion from the pancreatic beta cell, and it's also thought to have longer term effects through increasing insulin synthesis and beta cell mass. GLP-1 is also important in the control of postprandial digestion and absorption. So when nutrients reach the distal small intestine, they evoke release of GLP-1 and other hormones, and then these then strongly suppress gastric emptying to slow down further nutrient delivery in a sort of feedback loop. And of course, most interestingly for an obesity seminar, GLP-1 reduces acute food intake and overall body weight with both vagal afferent nerves from the intestine and central signaling playing roles in this. So given the insulinotropic and anorexogenic effects of GLP-1, incretin mimetic drugs targeting this system have been incredibly successful in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. As GLP-1 itself has a very short half-life of only one to two minutes, it can't be given as a drug directly. However, injectable degradation resistant GLP-1 receptor agonists have been developed. Alternatively, you can slow breakdown of endogenous GLP-1 using oral inhibitors of the DPP-4 peptidase. These drugs are really effective at improving glucose tolerance and the GLP-1 receptor agonists also induce significant weight loss. And reflecting this, one of these drugs called loraglutide has also recently been um, approved for use in non-diabetic patients who have a BMI over around 30 
um, and treatment with this kind of high dose loraglutide can lead to weight loss of around 5%, uh, which improves a lot of the other effects seen in obesity. However, despite the existence of lots of different anti-diabetic drugs, bariatric surgery is arguably still the most effective means of achieving weight loss and diabetes remission in overweight type 2 diabetics. And particularly striking improvements are seen following Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, which is this surgery here, which involves removing most of the stomach and rerouting ingested nutrients directly into the jejunum, so sort of the mid-small intestine. Um, where they mix with bile and ex exocrine pancreatic secretions coming from the duodenum. This surgery induces sustained feelings of satiety, leads to reduced energy intake and improves glycemic control beyond what you would expect just from the weight loss alone. And in fact, around 70% of diabetic patients sustain remission for around five years following Rome Y. Several different mechanisms have been proposed to underlie these effects, but our lab and others suggest that a key driver is the accelerated nutrient delivery that we see to the distal small intestine, and therefore exposure of the L cells here to the nutrients, and therefore a dramatic increase in secretion of the gut hormones. So if you look at the graphs on the bottom right, you can see that in the surgery cohorts, you get a dramatically increased um, levels of plasma GLP-1 and PYY or peptide YY. So pharmacologically stimulating endogenous secretion of these hormones or potentially selectively enhancing L cell number could potentially mimic some of the positive effects of bariatric surgery in, in, in a drug which would avoid such a dramatic operation. So to do this, we need good models of the interendocrine system. Uh, in vivo and ex vivo work is obviously highly physiological, but low throughput, and there's a limited about Limited, uh, limited ability to study cellular mechanisms. And of course, it's particularly challenging for human cells. So several tumor-derived cell lines have been established, uh, both from mice and humans. And while these are useful for initial and high throughput studies, major differences in expression of hormones and sensory machinery have been demonstrated compared to native enteroendocrine cells. So given these limitations, techniques have been developed to culture and isolate primary enteroendocrine cells. So we can make short-lived two-dimensional mixed primary epithelial cultures from a number of species for the study of gut hormone secretion directly. However, as these cells make up only around 1% of the gastrointestinal epithelium, we do need a way to identify them for single cell studies and purification by fact sorting. And the development of transgenic mouse models in the last decade has allowed us to see these cells by expressing fluorescent proteins under the control of hormonal promoters and therefore identify mouse enteroendocrine cells. Tissue from these mice has also been used to create intestinal organoids with fluorescently labeled enteroendocrine cells. So organoids are kind of organized, self-renewing 3D epithelial structures. And these are generated by providing adult stem cells of isolated intestinal crypts with an appropriate growth factor niche and extracellular matrix. Unlike freshly isolated tissue, these organoids can then be expanded in culture, maintained for many years, frozen down, re-established from stocks, and are also much easier to genetically modify than fresh tissue. So the next step, of course, for us is expanding this from mouse organoids to human organoids, um, which we've established from kind of discarded small pieces of surgical tissue. Um, although, of course, we don't have any transgenic humans, so we need other ways to develop the labeled models. So to label our human organoids, we generated a simple vector to insert the fluorescent protein venous at the end of the pro-growth pagon gene, which in the intestine is processed to GLP-1. Uh, this uses CRISPR-Cas9 homology donor repair, and we delivered this by electroporation directly into human ileal organoids. The presence of a neomycin-resistant cassette allows us to do antibiotic selection to find cells which have successfully integrated and uh, amplify those organoids. So I made this all look very simple on one slide, but this was many years of work um, to kind of optimize the interendocrine differentiation protocols. But we eventually did start to see some sort of green cells appear when we looked under fluorescent microscope. So we then confirmed by immunohistochemistry that we see co-localization of staining for venous and proglucagon. Um, and having this reporter model allowed us to more easily optimize the protocols and timings for L cell differentiation in human organoids, as we could see things 
as they were happening rather than having to fix and stain. So our base media at the moment is the recently validated novel IGF FGF culture condition, which we refer to here as IF, which was developed in the last few years by Toshiro Sato's lab. And as you can see, this gives a roughly physiological proportion of L cells within the organoid epithelium, so kind of under 1% of the total cell count. Um, however, for some experiments, we do need an increased L cell number. So combining some other protocols that exist in the literature, we established a new condition where we reduce the wink concentration and add small molecule inhibitors of the notch and MEK pathways to selectively drive enterendocrine differentiation. And in this media, which we've called IF star, you can see that we get a large number of L cells. Um, so we then sought to use this reporter line to kind of examine the function of human L cells in more detail. And the key questions that we have going into this are what nutrient and neurohormonal sensing pathways are expressed in human L cells? And in particular, whether there are any genes expressed that we haven't identified previously in our mouse data sets. And specifically to the organoid models, does driving enhanced interendocrine differentiation in our IF star media alter the expression profile of L cells or are these still physiologically relevant? So to do this, we took organoids which were fully differentiated in either IF or IF star media, digested them down to single cells, stained them with some live cell markers, DAPI and DRAC5, and then performed the fact sorting. So as you can see in the bottom right hand plot, we obtain a nice separation of venous positive and negative cells. We collect these separately for both bulk RNA sequencing and peptide analysis by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And as we expect from our staining experiments, we obtain a roughly five-fold increase in proportion of venous positive cells in the IF star media from around 0.4% to about 2%. And then within the venous positive populations, expression of the GLP-1 gene GCG is very similar between the two different media. And we see a, approximately a thousand-fold enrichment of GCG expression in the venous positive cells compared to their negative neighbors, confirming that our vectors targeted the correct gene. So we then performed principal component analysis, and we can see that the venous positive L cells from both culture media cluster very closely together. And when we look at the 500 most differentially expressed genes between the negative and the positive cells, there is little difference between the two different culture medias, suggesting that we can use these media interchangeably for functional experiments further down the line. We also perform peptidomics on sorted cells, which provided evidence at the protein level, for several, for several of the mRNA transcripts, which we'd seen enriched in the venous cells. So just to pull out a few things, we identified several enzymes involved in hormone biosynthesis and processing, such as the amidation enzyme PAM and the prohormone convertase PCSK1. And we also see co-expression of several other L-cell pe peptides, such as PYY, neurotensin, and pancreatic polypeptide, as we would expect. So we were then interested in following up some um, functional work on this. So to do this, we developed protocols to study secretion of GLP-1 from these cultures. And for this, we play out a two-dimensional culture, which facilitates access to both the apical and basal lateral surfaces of the cell, as well as allowing more reproducible quantification between secretion conditions compared to performing the secretion directly on 3D organoids. And this is just by mass spec showing that a range of different ileal hormones are all secreted in response to increased cyclic AMP levels following stimulation with Borskel and IBMX. We also developed similar, similar 2D culture protocols for single cell studies. So calcium responses in venous fluorescent cells can be assessed after loading with the calcium indicator dye for 2 And we can also directly patch clamp cells and show that the human L cells fire both spontaneous and evoked action potentials. So as glucose is a strong stimulator of GLP-1 secretion in vivo, we investigated whether this was also true in human organoids. And here we show that 10 millimolar glucose labeled here as 10G slightly enhances both basal and forceful stimulated GLP-1 secretion and also increases action potential firing. This effect was partly inhibited by fluoridsin, which is an inhibitor of the SGLT1 sodium glucose cotransporter, transporter 
which our group has previously shown to be critical for L-cell glucose sensing in mice. Uh, so we then were interested in looking at a kind of broader range of sensory receptors. Uh, the G-protein coupled receptors or GPCRs are important for a lot of the L-cell nutrient, sen nutrient sensing. So we examined the expression of these receptors. We did actually identify several novel or um, in particular orphan GPCRs, which we hadn't identified before in our murine data sets, which may be of importance for GLP-1 secretion. Uh, for this initial study, we focused on some of the most highly enriched receptors, which have previously been reported to simulate GLP-1 secretion. And we sought to determine whether these were functionally active in human organoid L cells. So the receptors that we studied in detail include the free fatty acid receptor, FIFR1, uh, the monoacylglycerol receptor, GPR119, and the bile acid receptor, GP, GPBAR. And we also saw highly enriched expression of receptors for the hormones arginine vasopressin and angiotensin II, which are both involved in fluid homeostasis and have been shown to stimulate GLP-1 secretion from the mouse colon. So we tested either the endogenous agonists or synthetic agonists for each of these receptors in turn. And we observed kind of significant uh, GLP-1 secretion. We also tested quite a few of these electrophysiologically and saw that they increased uh, the other cause of depolarization or induced action potential firing. Uh, for the GQ coupled receptors, which is FIFR1, ADP receptor and angiotensin receptor, we also observed single cell calcium elevations in response to stimulation, um, as you can see here. So that was just a very quick summary, um, but we've kind of confirmed in this work that the previously reported importance of nutrient and bile acid sensing pathways um, for physiological and pharmacological stimulation of GLP-1 secretion stands true in human cells um, and is likely to be the basis of any drugs which do try and increase endogenous GLP-1 secretion for the treatment of diabetes or obesity. Um, our transcriptomic and peptidomic profiling of human L cells will form a basis hopefully for future mechanistic studies and potential developments of new therapeutics. Um, it would also be interesting to see whether any drugs can be developed which selectively increase L cell number, um, which is something we haven't tried to do here, but we, we know we can do with our system using kind of high throughput imaging um, experiments. So overall, we've shown that human organoids can be used for fairly high throughput assessment of L cell function in a species specific manner. Um, and this is one of the first kind of well validated models of the human L cell. Um, and the methods that we've optimized for labeling and functional characterization of enterendocrine cells in human organoids should hopefully be easily expandable to other hormonal promoters and other regions of the GI tract, which would allow us to compare, you know, are different hormones stimulated differently? And is there, for example, any differences in the um, secretion stimulus coupling of L cells in the ileum versus in the colon? Um, and some other recent work from Hans Klaver's lab has also shown that these methods, once they're working, can be easily applied to lots of different cell types. So that's hopefully where this will be going next. So just to finish up, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Frank Ryman and Fiona Gribble and the other members of the lab, in particular Deborah, who established our organoid protocols and generated the Gluvenus line. Um, which, as I said, was an incredible amount of work. Thanks also to Van, who performed all of the EFIS. Um, there's a lot more than what I mentioned here. Chris for helping with RNA-seq, and Rachel Richard and Amy, who carried out the mass spec experiments. And I'd also like to thank all the core facilities who made this work possible, and the Wellcome Trust for funding my PhD and much of the other work in our lab. Uh, so thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions or discussion points after Kat's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for an interesting talk there. Uh, our second speaker today is Katrina Villaria from the University of Birmingham. She is a postdoc investigating the pancreatic islet function and glucagon secretion through the vitamin D binding pathway. Thank you, Kat. Yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Katrina Villaria, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Birmingham. Um, and today I'm excited to share with you the data from our recently published paper, which was actually 
uh, published mid lockdown. Um, we were actually finishing up the final experiments for this paper uh, just in time before the labs closed with a lot of drama and excitement. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of excited to finally get it published uh, despite the unusual circumstances that we went through. Um, so thank you again to the Physiological Society for inviting me today. Um, so today I'll be talking about vitamin D binding protein. Um, and despite what the name suggests, it has many other functions other than binding to vitamin D. And what we found is that it's a pretty important factor in regulating alpha cell function. Um, so before I start, I want to give a quick background on where I came from. Um, I grew up in Alaska and I did my undergrad in biology at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And after I thought I needed a change of scenery, I went to Kingston University in London to do my master's and my PhD, where I mainly studied matricellular proteins and the role in the islet. And after deciding that I wanted to continue studying diabetes, I went on to University of Birmingham to work with David Hodson to continue my postdoctoral research. Um, so I appreciate that we come from a white vial uh, background of physiology, so I'd like to give a brief interview on diabetes. Um, when we think of diabetes, uh, people focus on the defects of beta cells and insulin, but the pancreatic islet functions as a unit. Um, alpha cells as well as delta cells are sort of the hidden figures of the islet, um, given that their role in diabetes is now starting to be appreciated, that diabetes is more than just dysfunctional beta cells, but dysfunctional islets as a whole. The islet consists of hormone-secreting endocrine cells. Primarily, the most abundant are the insulin-secreting beta cells you can see here um, in the center of a mouse islet. So diabetes results from the loss of beta cells or the loss of beta cell function, ending in inadequate insulin levels. But also important in glucose homeostasis are the counter-regulatory hormones, um, glucagon secreted by the alpha cells, which you can see at the um, outer periphery of the islet, and as well as the somatostatin secreted by delta cells. Um, the, the islet is a highly tightly regulated system that works together to achieve homeostasis. The release of each hormone is timed in response to glucose levels. So as um, hypo during hypoglycemic conditions when glucose levels are low, alpha cells are active to release glucagon, which in turn stimulates the liver to release glucose back into circulation to increase um, blood glucose. And as blood glucose rise, beta cells then actively release insulin to signal the tissues to absorb glucose and consequently bringing glucose levels back to basal levels. So the release of each hormone can also influence the release of the other. So overall keeping the islet in check. And a classic example of this is somatostatin, which is also known as the master inhibitor hormone. It's released normally in sync with insulin, preventing insulin hypersecretion and beta cell stress. But somatostatin can also inhibit glucagon release, and this becomes important, especially at high glucose levels. Glucagon um, has also been shown to inhibit beta cells, particularly during hypoglycemia, but it can also function to amplify insulin release at very high glucose levels. So in fact, it's been shown that glucagon receptor activation in beta cells is essential for amplified glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. So you can appreciate from the side how dysfunction in one endocrine cell can tip the balance of the entire system. Um, in type 1 diabetes, though it results from autoimmune attack of the beta cells, alpha cells lose their glucose sensing abilities and they could remain active at high glucose and exacerbate hyperglycemia. But they can also lose their activation at low glucose, making an individual vulnerable to hypoglycemia. Vitamin D binding protein has been called so because it was discovered as a transporter of vitamin D metabolites. A DBP binds and carries vitamin D in circulation from the liver to the kidneys and to its respective target tissues. Most of uh, vitamin D metabolites 
uh, is bound to DVP and only a small fraction circulates as free hormones in serum. And it is suggested that it is a free fraction that is biologically active. Um, vitamin D is easily excreted in the urine and binding to DVP facilitates its recycling back into circulation. But DVP has many other uh, non-vitamin D functions. It also is known as an actin scavenger that binds to monomeric G actin, and it prevents its repolymerization to F actin. Um, DVP can also bind to fatty acids and stimulate macrophage and osteoclasts. Um, it's highly expressed in the liver, where a lot of vitamin D is metabolized, and uh, recently it's been shown from RNA-seq data from purified alpha cells um, that DBP mRNA is highly localized in these cells. However, the role in alpha cells hasn't really fully been explored. Um, interestingly, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes have been associated to DBP serum levels and gene polymorphisms. Um, an interesting paper was published last year where they show de-differentiating beta cells um, and beta cells from diabetic mice have upregulated the expression of DBP. So this suggests that DBP is normally downregulated in beta cells and its upregulation could signal as a marker of de-differentiation. Um, on the other hand, DBP levels are observed to be decreased in type 1 diabetes. And it's shown in the study here on the left, when T cells are exposed to DVP, they become activated and release cytokines, similar to other known type 1 diabetes or antigens such as insulin. So while there's growing evidence pointing to an important role of DVP in diabetes progression, the underlying mechanism of why that is, is not yet known. Um, interestingly, another paper was published last year characterizing the only um, human known to have a homozygous deletion for DVP. Um, and this person, though showed low levels of serum vitamin D, did not show signs of vitamin D deficiency, namely the abnormal calcium in bone homeostasis. So that suggests that DVP may, may have other non-vitamin D related roles in disease. So we wanted to investigate DVP function in the islet, focusing on the alpha cells using mice that were de globally deleted for DVP expression. Um, these knockout mice, like the human lacking DVP, also had low serum vitamin D levels, but they also did not show any signs of vitamin D deficiency. Um, that's a point I'll come back to later. Um, so we first looked at the islet morphology. Alpha cells are normally 20% of the islet mass. So we found that um, deletion of DVP did not affect the percent alpha cell mass per islet. So, okay, that looks normal, but as we look closer, alpha cells are smaller, but they also increase in number. So overall, keeping um, the total alpha cell mass seem normal. Um, so we then looked at their calcium activity and see if their signaling is intact. Um, here's a heat map showing calcium activity of the islet stimulated at low glucose at 0.5 millimolar, you can see a significant decrease in the area of how many alpha cells are showing activity. And when uh, we looked at the amplitude of the signal here, you can see a representative trace of individual alpha cells, the knockouts um, showing here in the blue. We saw a significant increase in the signal amplitude. So this indicates to us that the loss of DVP results in the loss of functional alpha cells. And those that are functional increase their activity in compensation. Um, and with the help of our collaborator, Linford Bryan from University of Oxford, who performed patch clamp electrophysiology, we found that knockout alpha cells had impaired sodium channel inactivation, indicating a loss in glucose sensing abilities. The increased calcium amplitude we saw earlier um, was also accompanied by increased amplitude in sodium current indicating to us that indeed there is a functional defect and alpha cells have maladapted compensation for the loss of functional cells. Now this DBP deletion impaired glucagon secretion. So the next step was to look at the secretory function. 
So the graph here shows glucose levels following insulin injection in mice. You can see the well-type mice, um, the blood glucose goes down in response to insulin, and over time it recovers back to normal glycemia. So that indicates adequate counter-regulation from the alpha cells. In the knockout mice, however, glucose levels dip lower than insulin injection, and they also recover from it a lot slower. Um, I should also mention that the error bars you see here look big because this is showing standard deviation rather than the SEM. But the graph here on the right shows the blood glucose um, compared to the baseline. And indeed, um, the blood glucose levels of the knockout mice um, drop more, and this was significant 30 minutes after injection. So that indicates that the knockout mice are more insulin sensitive, hinting a defect in the counter regulatory response of the alpha cells. And that was supported by what we saw when we stimulated um, isolated islets with low glucose and epinephrine. Glucagon secretion was significantly decreased in the knockouts. Now we wanted to know if this was reflected in vivo, and this is a, one of the last critical pieces of data we managed to finish just in time before lockdown. Um, as a very exciting finale question to answer, mice uh, that were lacking DVP did indeed secrete less glucagon in vivo in response to decreases in blood glucose. Um, now the big question now is to find out how is this possible? Um, mechanistically, how is DVP functioning? Um, as I mentioned previously, although serum vitamin D levels were reduced in the DVP knockout mice, there was no apparent signs of vitamin D deficiency unless they were put on a deficient diet. So it seems that DVP actions, at least in the islet environment, is independent of vitamin D function. Um, so we then turn our attention to other things that DVP binds to. Actin was particularly interesting because um, it plays a role in regulating secretion in antiocytosis. Actin remodeling facilitates the movement and the transport of granules to the plasma membrane, as well as, as its tethering to TSNAP proteins for exocytosis to take place. Um, in particular, it's been shown that a dense F actin network in alpha cells can inhibit glucagon secretion. So we became interested in looking at actin. Um, and here you can see a picture of islet stain for F actin. And you can see a massive increase in the fluorescence intensity and the fiber thickness of polymerized F actin. Although what we saw was it wasn't ex exclusive to alpha cells, it was observed throughout the islet. And we observed the same striking difference in the monomeric G actin, where we saw a massive decrease throughout the islet as well. So these pictures show you a very um, striking difference in the knockout phenotype, but what does this mean? So we became interested in looking even closer at the granule level. So here is a super resolution image of glucagon staining, where you can see actual individual glucagon granules. Um, you can see the striking difference where the granules are significantly smaller in the knockout mice, and they're also more diffusely scattered compared to the wild types, um, suggesting to us that DBP may influence granule maturity and the trafficking um, in the cytoplasm, possibly through f actin remodeling. The next thing we wanted to know was, are the changes in function related to changes in f actin? And can we restore wild type phenotype by um, restoring actin levels? Um, so we treated islets with latrunculine, which is a toxin that depolymerizes F actin. We worked at concentrations that restored F actin levels closest to the wild type levels. Um, so we then checked to see how this may affect their calcium activity. And um, excitingly, we found that rescuing normal F actin levels recruited more functional alpha cells at low glucose. So they're showing more calcium activity at hypoglycemic conditions. Um, so now we wanted to know whether this affected the beta cells. Um, first of all, was DVP present in the beta cells? Uh, we did see some faint staining 
in the beta cells, although this was actually only apparent after we've increased antibody concentration. So there is some BVP, but not as it's not as highly expressed compared to alpha cell. Um, and we observed that deletion of DVP did not have effect on beta cell morphology. We also saw normal beta cell mass and normal cell number. Um, calcium activity was also intact and the knockout mice had normal glucose tolerance. However, the knockout islets had significantly increased insulin secretion when we stimulated them with high glucose. And the total insulin contact was normal, indicating that the defect was through secretion and not through production of insulin. So it seems like that DBP may be contributing to preventing too much insulin secretion during hyperglycemia. And although improved insulin secretion may be a good sign of beta cell function, over secretion is also not good as it extends the stage for beta cell stress and eventually loss of function. So we then also wanted to look at delta cells. Um, we found that DBP is also detected in some somatostatin expressing delta cells, but not, not all. Um, and this was a result that we didn't expect to see, but we observed a massive decrease in delta cell mass. They were also significantly smaller in size. And interestingly, uh, we didn't see differences in expression of delta cell identity markers. So that indicates that the delta cells are not likely losing their identity or are de-differentiated de-differentiating, but there, there's likely a defect in a specification or during development. Uh, we look closer at the calcium activity of delta cells as well. So here's a representative uh, trace of individual delta cells. Um, we find that though calcium signaling was normal, the area of delta cells that was functional was increased suggesting that the delta cells are active to are that are active compensate for the loss of cell mass so this also may likely contribute to the increased insulin secretion from the beta cells as the inhibitory signal somatostatin from delta cells has massively decreased um, so with the help of our collaborators from Exeter in Canada we got a chance to look at human tissues from two biobanks um, in humans, DVP was also found to be localized in glucagon expressing alpha cells. Um, interestingly, the alpha cell uh, expression of DVP increases with age in healthy humans, and this peaks at the age of 18 to 32 uh, and stays increased thereafter. So this suggests to so us that DVP function becomes very important as alpha cells mature. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, though type 1 diabetes is a result of an autoimmune attack on beta cells, alpha cells also have a story in this disease in that um, their glucose sensing eventually becomes dysregulated and may have potential risk of hypoglycemia. Um, in early onset type 1 diabetes, where we looked at tissues um, from donors ages 2 to 10 years old, we found no changes in DVP expression between control and disease. But however, in late onset type 1 diabetes, um, between the ages of 18 42, and 42 years old, we found that although most alpha cells still express DVP, the fluorescence or intensity of expression significantly decreased. And this is accompanied by reduced alpha cell area as well and overall glucagon secretion. Uh, the same was um, the same case was observed when we looked at pancreas tissues from donors with more long-standing type 1 diabetes. Um, and this was another surprising um, image to see using super resolution imaging. DB DBP was localized to glucagon granules. And not only was it localized to the granules, DBP was found at the granule membrane. So this suggests that it may indeed play a role in granule fusion to the cell membrane. Um, in type 1 diabetes, this colocalization decreases. Um, there are significantly less DVP positive, glucagon positive alpha cells. Um, and as in, and also we see a significant decrease in the granule size. So the knockout mice alpha cells 
um, or sorry, the alpha cells of type 1 diabetes, similar to the knockout mouse alpha cells, also show more diffused, um, randomly diff distributed glucagon granules compared to the healthy controls. So this suggests that there may be similar acting changes in the knockout mice, um, in the humans as in the knockout mice. And likely the DBP regulates granule trafficking um, through F-actin cytoskeleton. So the F-actin cytoskeleton plays a critical role in regulating cell shape, um, cell polarity, and their development. And it's now being appreciated as important in determining exocrine to endocrine cell fate. Uh, so this may explain changes in alpha cell and the, the changes we see in alpha cell and those cell mass. Um, so this is definitely something interesting to look at and study the role of F-actin in endocrine cell specification. Um, so overall, this study has highlighted the role of DVP in alpha cells and that it does have a profound role um, in their function. When we delete DVP, this results in defects in cytoskeletal dynamics. Uh, we also see decreased alpha cell calcium and electrical activity, and overall this has an effect on its secretory function. And this has a direct effect on beta and delta cell functions as well. It's quite interesting to see that um, the pancreatic islets have their own supplier of DVP, um, which suggests to us that it has a specialized role in fine-tuning the islets, um, also further highlighting the role of alpha cells in diabetes. Um, what we hope to look at now is study the role of DVP in type 2 diabetes and what happens if we stress our knockout mice with a high fat diet. And ultimately, could we potentially use DVP as a target for diabetes treatment? Um, so I'd like to end this presentation by quickly thanking the people involved, particularly members of the lab and my supervisor, David Hodson, and also other members of the Institute of Metabolism at UOB, especially Martin Hewison, who has been our DVP expert, um, and also our many collaborator, collaborators from Exeter, Canada, and Oxford who have made a massive contribution to the project. So thank you again. Thank you, Kat. Another fascinating talk there. Um, Emily, if I could start with you. Are all L cells pro-glucagon or GLP-1 positive? Yes, so by definition, um, Enteroendocrine cells were initially defined by this kind of like one cell, one hormone hypothesis. It's now been shown that there's much more overlap than was previously thought, but we've kind of stuck with the old nomenclature. So by definition, a cell which expresses GLP-1 is an L cell, um, but the expression patterns of the other hormones might change um, depending on where you are within the GI tract and as well as where you are on the kind of crypt villus axis. Okay, thank you. And um, would you not have expected a more robust response when treating your organoid model with glucose? Yes, we, the response was a lot lower in magnitude than um, we expected. Um, we thought that was maybe because they were kind of cultured in a rich nutrient buffer, um, but we tried lots of things. Um, and I think it's just, they're not quite as glucose sensitive as in vivo that's potentially due to the maturity of the L cells. So they're in a kind of crypt-like state in the organoid model. Um, it's something we do want to play around with at some point in the future, um, because we know from primary culture that we get a much a greater magnitude of response to glucose, um, but they were still responding and it was SGLT1 dependent, at least to an extent. And a question from our Q&A panel. Um, have you seen any effect of short chain fatty acids or even long chain fatty acids on GLP-1 secretion in your model? Yes, so the, in terms of the long chain fatty acids, they typically activate FIFAR1 and FIFAR4. Um, we didn't directly test any kind of long chain fatty acids, but we used the synthetic agonist of that same receptor, and that's where we saw kind of really significant GLP-1 secretion. Um, we haven't tested any short chain fatty acids, um, but FIFAR2 and 3, which are the short chain receptors, were expressed. Um, so we would expect them to stimulate secretion. But the reason we use the synthetic agonists is just because they're more specific to each receptor. Um, but I, I would be surprised if they didn't induce secretion. Okay. 
And another question which just popped up there is, do the organoids host K cells in addition to L cells? Yes. So K cells are those which express GIP. Um, we've definitely seen that in duodenal organoids. Um, there's a small amount of GIP expression in the ileum, but very low. So we, we could pick it up as, at the mRNA level, but not as a protein. Um, but if we're interested in K cells, then we would look at kind of more proximal small intestine um, to study that. Thanks for that, Emily. So I've just got um, one more question, and this kind of leads on nicely from the K-cell one. So I was thinking about taking this from organoids to organ on a chip. So do you plan to take this from an L-cell model to um, combine it with other intestinal gut cells on a chip? And how far off do you think you are from being able to achieve that? And um, I guess how physiologically relevant or how physiological do you think these models will be in terms of communication? Mm. I think the organoid model is a good one in that it expresses all the cell types. So even though we've labeled the L cells, all the other endogenous okay. cell types are still there. Um, in our lab, we're probably not going to go down the kind of organ on a chip biophysics uh, avenue, but we've kind of spoken to other labs and collaborated with those who are. Um, okay. And you can sort of grow organoids in a sort of uh, kind of like physical matrix, because that is one of the problems of the organoid model is that you're reliant on um, extracellular matrices produced from kind of cell lines um, or animals, which then is highly variable and also has problems for clinical um, translation because you're using animal derived material. Uh, but yeah. yeah, something for the future, but probably not within our scope. Okay, great. And now um, we'll go on and some questions for Kat. Um, so I was going to ask about the, you know, there's some sketchy evidence on vitamin D supplementation, diabetes and glucose homeostasis. You know, some people say it's great, other people say it's negligible. So how does that tie in to a role for vitamin D binding protein? Um, you mean how it's how the supplementation affects? Yeah, so how does that link in with you know this potential role for um well as we've seen that the DVP in, in, at least in islet functions, is likely not acting through vitamin D. Um, it's likely acting through the S-actin and the cell, um, cell shape, cell morphology, and ultimately um, glucose or glucagon granules okay. and its transport. Um, but I'm not saying that supplementation will not help, <laughs> um, but it's likely that um, DVP is acting not through vitamin D, um, because also we've seen that the knockout mice um, are not showing um, signs of vitamin D deficiency unless they're on a deficient diet. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, so I guess the other thing I was going to ask was, are there any other drugs that interact with vitamin D binding protein and have you know, negative or beneficial effects? Uh, not that I know of so far. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Joe, over to you. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> uh, Kat, well, am I right in thinking that your model was a global knockout model? Mm -hmm. um, so would you expect the phenotype, phenotype to recapitulate if it was specific to alpha cells, given that DBP is highly expressed in the liver? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, ideally we would have a more alpha cell specific model. Um, but currently there are no um, mice models that are FOX for GC or DVP. Um, but eventually we would like to acquire these mice and eventually do a specific alpha cell specific knockout. But although given that the global knockout model has been able to expose an underappreciated role DVP also in beta cells and delta cells that express it a lot less in comparison. But yes, ultimately we'd like to repeat that in um, alpha cell specific knockout. Certainly. And how did you assess the glucose tolerance in your mouse model? Was it via oral or IP glucose tolerance? Uh, that's IP glucose tolerance, yeah. Yeah. And had the animals been fed a high fat diet prior to that or were these lean animals? No, we're currently working on that at the moment. So we want to put, we're putting the mice on a high fat diet and we want to look at um, the glucose tolerance as well. 
Mm-hmm. And um, do you expect uh, do you expect therefore it's going to be like negatively affected? Um, I don't know how it's going to affect it yet, but it the the there has been a study that has put knockout eye, uh, mice on high fat diet, and that increases the expression of DDP. So potentially that may have a significant role. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no remaining questions, I'd like to thank both Kat and Emily for their talks today and for you for attending the session. Um, the webinar series continues next week with a look at the hepatic regulation of appetite and also in the disease state. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>